She is also a consult liaison psychiatrist at the Palo Alto Veterans Affairs. As the director of the Translational Therapeutics Lab and associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Dr. Rodriguez leads studies investigating the brain basis of severe mental disorders. Her landmark clinical trials pioneer rapid acting treatments for illnesses, including obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. She has NIH foundation and donor funded grants where she has investigated the mechanistic and clinical efficacy studies that span targeted glutamatergic and opioid pathway pharmacotherapy, non-invasive brain stimulation, and psychotherapy for OCD, PTSD, and hoarding disorder. Dr. Rodriguez also serves as deputy editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry, a member of the Research Council of the American Psychiatric Association, and many other important boards and foundations. She's won several national awards, including the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and she's presented her research work widely. Dr. Rodriguez received her Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science from Harvard University, followed by an MD from Harvard Medical School, MIT's HST program, and a PhD in Neuroscience and Genetics from Harvard Medical School. Born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, she now lives with her husband and three children in Palo Alto. And I think you can see why I am so excited to welcome Dr. Rodriguez today. She will be presenting on the topic, Novel Interventions for OCD. And with that, thank you so much, Dr. Rodriguez. Oh, one more thing. We are also following this with a career talk. That is for anyone who wishes to come. Um, it's about challenges, opportunities, and lessons learned in an academic research career path. After we have Q&A at the end of Grand Rounds, anyone who wants to stay on for the career talk, please do. And um, we will promote you to panelists so we can have a robust conversation and discussion with Dr. Rodriguez. So with that, I am now turning this over to Dr. Rodriguez. Welcome. Thank you so much, Shelley. And uh, I was just uh, speaking with Shelley uh, earlier that this really feels like um, kind of coming back full circle because my interest in OCD really originated um, there um, at McLean um, um, with the OCDI um, and, uh, you know, the seeing just giants doing wonderful work. And I know the OCD bench is, uh, is very deep there. Um, you know, Scott, Scott Rausch is a pioneer in the field and somebody I've really admired. And uh, Brian Brennan and Jane Eisen do wonderful work through the OCDI. Um, as well, you know, having Carrie Ressler and folks like Bill Carlos on there, it's really incredible and so lovely to see as, you know, all the names that were popping up um, who are here today. So um, it's really, really just a, a pleasure. And McLean is really a place that is uh, near and dear to my heart. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about, um, let's do this, okay, uh, novel interventions for OCD. Um, I'm uh, really excited to do some thought experiments with you, share some data that's hot off the press, and uh, we'll, we'll have some fun. Okay, so first off, I want you guys to um, do a thought experiment with me. So imagine you're on a hike and you have been walking for hours, you're hot, you're parched, um, but you left your canteen. Um, and you look around and the only water lies in a toilet bowl. Would you drink it? So um, I'd like invite you to share um, in the chat box now, one of three things. So one, uh, please put one, if you would drink right away, Please put two in the chat box if you would think about it a little bit, um, debate it, and but ultimately you would you would drink it. And three, absolutely no way you would not drink. So go go ahead and do that now. I'm seeing seeing some numbers in the chat, and uh, oh my goodness, lots of people. Okay, uh, and and Chris, um, if you could unmute yourself and just kind of give me a sense um, as the numbers were going through. Um, which one, which, uh, which one was, uh, was the most common? Or was it kind of even distribution? Let me see. We've got mostly twos and threes. Looks okay. like probably twos. Uh, well, I'm going to say twos and threes are maybe tied. 
Twos and threes, um, okay. Twos and okay. threes. Okay, so a little bit in this group, a little bit less people just drink right away. Um, so what I'd love is the people who put in two, who would like kind of wait a little bit and drink. Could you put into the chat why you waited? And Chris, I'll have you read out a couple couple reasons why people waited. So why not drink right away? Why not drink right away? Wait to see what happens to others, hoping to find <laughs> another option. <laughs> we got Make a sure it's the, the only option. See if uh, anyone else has water. Wh why? Why would you wait? What? What are you? <laughs> there you could be alternatives. Okay. Wonder if it's sanitary. Okay. Okay. Good. So, so we're getting to some sanitary. Maybe, maybe there's germs. Maybe you'll get infected. Maybe, you know, um, these are common, common uh, thoughts and hesitations. And um, <clears throat> the reason why I wanted to to highlight that is because that thought pause made a difference between you selecting or one and two. And to somebody who has OCD with um, contamination, uh, drinking from a regular fountain may feel like drinking from a toilet. So this is an exhibition um, in San Francisco um, uh, in the Exploratorium. I hope you can, you can visit if you come to San Francisco. And um, it is a, a, a kind of a social experiment there in the museum where they have a toilet that has never been you know, uh, um, used next to a water fountain. And what you'll see is people kind of naturally sort into these groups, people who like are kind of attracted by it, they'll drink from, from the toilet water fountain. Some people who are kind of like talking about it ultimately will drink. And some people like me who are just kind of trying to get by the exhibit. Um, so you know, the, the, the purpose of this is really to, um, to highlight um, the impairing parts of OCD that we don't typically see, which is um, in the course of the day, if you're having these thoughts and trying to debate and trying to estimate, it's going to delay your getting out the door in the morning. It's gonna delay your work. It's gonna delay conversations you have, connections with other people. And if you add all those things together, uh, it can be very impairing. <clears throat> And you know, OCD is, is quite severe. Um, it's impairing uh, one in seven adults with OCD will attempt suicide in their lifetime. And it can affect individuals like John, um, who's a disguised case, but John was a student who went into college and um, you know, was bombarded um, with um, thoughts that things just didn't feel right. And he was tormented, he would stay up all night uh, writing and rewriting his homework. Um, and in the morning, he would spend hours um, compulsively changing his shirts until one felt right. Uh, he missed his classes. He, um, uh, he, he couldn't function. His girlfriend broke up with him. And John suffered from the topic today, obsessive compulsive disorder, which as you know, is characterized by intrusive uh, recurring thoughts called obsessions and accompanied by anxiety-driven re repetitive behaviors called uh, compulsions. And we know that standard treatments uh, include medications um, and cognitive behavioral therapy with exposure and response prevention. And they help about half of individuals with OCD. But unfortunately, another half are, are not helped. And there can be a long lag time of two to three months um, before individuals have uh, symptomatic relief. And complete relief is, is not common. Um, so in this case, John wasn't really helped uh, by, by these uh, symptoms. And converging evidence um, you know, by, by Scott Rausch here and, and many others in the field um, have led us to evidence suggesting that OCD is associated with um, a hyperactive brain circuit. And so parts of the brain um, that are important for generating thoughts um, and motor responses are in this kind of hyperactive feedback loop. Um, and you know, some theories uh, posit that, that this loop doesn't have a stop signal. And without the stop signal, you know, potentially that's why folks like uh, individuals like John are bombarded with these intrusive thoughts. But um, you know, as a neuroscientist and, uh, and uh, a psychiatrist, I'm really interested in the, in the, the underlying mechanism of this. So, 
you know, at what level of the brain um, is our obsessions encoded, our compulsions encoded? Um, if we have a better understanding of the neurobiology and mechanisms underlying OCD, we have a better chance of intervening. And we don't yet know at what level is best to intervene. Some of our drugs act on the receptor side, neuromodulation in, on the circuit level. Um, and how do these kind of build up into networks um, and that synchrony of um, response, how does that actually translate to behavior? So today I'll be talking about work that I've done um, focused on helping that other half of individuals who aren't helped by first-line treatments, um, specifically experimental therapeutics. Um, we'll go into some new neuromodulation um, uh, studies and um, really trying to kind of highlight along the way you know, what, what are the opportunities for look, studying mechanisms through neuroimaging and biomarkers and looking at processes like inhibitory control. So my research um, you know, first started in really in the state of the field in OCD, there was a lot of interest and excitement about glutamate, uh, which is the main chemical messenger um, in uh, uh, that brain, brain cells use to communicate with each other. And at the time, too much glutamate release was thought to contribute to this hyperactivity. And I was really interested in how can we modulate the effects of glutamate in the brain? And a drug called ketamine at that time, when I was first starting, was really getting a lot of interest. Um, there was some really exciting work um, by a number of groups. And, and, and at that time, I had seen the replication of some of the earlier work by Berman et al. by Carlos Zarate at NIH. Um, and I was really interested in, um, you know, trying to understand if the rapid action that was published at the time in depression could uh, be important for OCD. And at that time, Welsh et al. had um, uh, published a really nice paper of an um, animal model of this um, compulsive grooming behavior. Um, that was a knockout of SAPHAP. It was a protein that formed these key scaffolding complexes and excitatory um, synapses. Um, and this model generated these anxiety-like behaviors and had corticostriatal synaptic deficits that were rescued when the SAPHAP3 uh, was expressed in the striatum, which again is another region um, that was important, um, highlighted by previous work important in OCD. And so um, we thought about testing um, the idea that could ketamine decrease OCD symptoms and started with um, you know, initial uh, case study and then uh, followed it up with a randomized study, randomizing individuals um, uh, to IV ketamine or saline. And um, it, this was a very simple proof of concept study just to see if there was a signal there. Um, it was a randomized um, crossover study. So individuals would get um, infusion of ketamine, infusion of saline or placebo um, at least one week apart, but the order was randomized. Um, the reason to design a study this way is because you can combine the two, the two phases of the study um, and get increased power. However, it presumes that you don't have a carryover effect. And uh, I was really surprised um, based on what I had known about ketamine and depression that the effects actually persisted. And so um, what I'll be presenting um, is only the phase one study uh, that doesn't have the carryover effects. And so we asked individuals on a scale of zero to 10, um, zero being no intrusive thoughts and 10 being constant um, intrusive thoughts, um, how they were feeling um, at baseline. Um, and then uh, throughout the following week. And after a, a 0.5 mix per kg infusion highlighted here in green, the um, uh, folks that got the saline or placebo, their um, intrusive thoughts remained pretty much the same, but to our great surprise, um, ketamine uh, very rapidly knocked down those intrusive thoughts and, um, you know, even, even past the time the ketamine was um, metabolized, long past um, the side effects had left, people felt like they were back at baseline and they continued to have uh, these thoughts. So, you know, in, in the field of OCD, you may be familiar with an instrument called the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. And we set a priority 
35% reduction in the Y-box score as um, responders. And so half of the individuals that got ketamine met this criteria for responders, whereas those with um, saline did not. And what was the experience for them like? So, you know, they would say things like, I felt the weight of OCD has been lifted. I want to feel this way forever. Um, and there was one individual who saw me kind of like check my pocket for my keys. And he said, you know, gosh, wow, I really was thinking that that would be triggering. I, th I thought that I would have OCD thoughts, but I, I really didn't. As you may know, um, ketamine has side effects. Um, everybody who got ketamine in our study felt dissociated, floating feeling. There's mild transient changes in blood pressure and heart rate. And you have to do things like, you know, instruct patients not to drive for um, 24 hours. So, um, you know, as a clinician, those things give me pause. So in summary, this is the first study showing ketamine can decrease intrusive thoughts. Um, interestingly, we, we, um, most of the glutamate um, uh, modulator studies in the field of OCD had occurred with people who were already on SSRIs and it was an augmentation study. But this is the first study where um, we saw both rapid effects and they were not taking any other uh, medication. So it was the first time that this glutamate, uh, you know, theorized glutamate modulation could be a therapeutic target for OCD. As I hinted at, um, you know, just want to, to uh, describe some caution with ketamine. Um, the effects are transient. Um, it's costly if you go to clinics. Um, it's not FDA approved for, for OCD. Um, there are side effects. It is a drug of abuse. We don't know the long-term effects yet of repeated dosing and recreational abusers who are taking ketamine at much higher doses can have bladder toxicity and cognitive problems that have been reported. And there's a lot of variability in the monitoring of the ketamine clinics. Um, in depression, um, the Council on Research and the APA, uh, which I'm a part of, um, commissioned a couple of different pieces. And one of these was a uh, meta-analysis of um, seven placebo-controlled studies in depression. And that summary showed compelling evidence of ketamine's effects as rapid, robust, and albeit um, transient, but for depression. And there's been a lot of wonderful literature published in potential mechanisms um, involving beyond glutamate, right? Um, so um, I'll highlight some work that we've done in the opioid um, uh, pathway, synaptic plasticity, wonderful work looking, um, you know, uh, recently also a prefrontal cortical spine formation. And so, um, you know, the, the, the animal uh, model really drove my interest in ketamine. Um, and then, you know, seeing that sort of clinical finding, the next step I really wanted to understand is um, mechanisms uh, in humans. Um, and kind of challenge that assumption that, you know, does ketamine actually change levels of glutamate? And you can use something called magnetic resonance spectroscopy, where you can look at very, like predetermined area. So there's pros and cons, but if you put um, this um, you know, box here called the voxel, you can look at neurochemical changes in that particular uh, region of the brain. And in collaboration with Dacoma Shangu, who was at, at Cornell at the time, and Larry Kegelis at Columbia, um, we used um, uh, Megapress to be able to look at the combination of glutamate and glutamine and GLX and GABA changes. And what we found surprised me. So this study it definitely has a lot of, a lot of noise in it, but um, we didn't really see a, like a huge peak of um, GLX. And instead, what we saw is that there was a, an increase, significant increase in and GABA, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain one hour post-infusion. Um, and we actually did a parallel study with Matthew Milak at Columbia at the time where he did the same exact protocol in depression and we did it in, in OCD participants. And his study uh, published in Molecular Psychiatry showed that glutamate and GABA increased in depression. Um, however, ours was just with GABA. Um, suggesting that, that there may be <coughs> Excuse me. Ketamine may have a unique neurochemical signature in OCD relative to depression. So this definitely needs replication in, in a larger sample. And <clears throat> we are conducting um, an NIH funded 
um, now completed. We've just um, uh, uh, finished collecting data on our last subject on a large study randomizing OCD participants to ketamine versus midazolam, which is somewhat of a more active control. And uh, looking at magnetic resonance spectroscopy, um, fMRI, looking at circuit level and EEG, um, in order to be able to look at the mechanisms of ketamine's effects. Um, so I'm really looking forward to unblinding that and um, you know, taking a look at, those, a look at those studies. I also wanna give you a sneak peek um, in terms of our attempts to kind of you know, circle back to the animal model. And um, I um, had, did neuroscience in my PhD in, in kind of a former life. And one of the wonderful things about translational therapeutics is you can collaborate with wonderful um, animal researchers. And um, Lisa Ganadin um, and her uh, graduate student, Gwen Davis, partnered, uh, we partnered together uh, to examine ketamine in uh, the SAPHAP3 knockout mouse, which I had mentioned earlier. And so the first step, um, to, and, and, and you know, just kind of giving you the bottom line here, uh, ketamine increased the activity of a frontostradial projection that regulates compulsive behavior. So it was really nice, very satisfying to, to kind of come full circle to that. Um, and so what she started um, uh, in, in the experiments is basically trying to see um, how, you know, what are kind of the baseline behavioral metrics and does it, does it kind of sync up with what we had seen um, in, in individuals with OCD? And so um, the way she assesses looking at uh, baseline grooming behaviors, both bouts and duration, and then giving um, in both the SAPAP3 knockout and the wild type animals and um, doing injection of ketamine or saline um, and then looking at uh, one hour, one day, three days, and seven days, kind of a sim similar time courses we had done. And um, she was able to, to, to recapitulate um, or, 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 or verify that um, in knockout animals, those are the ones in purple here, they had more grooming behaviors than the wild type. So that's already been published. So it's just like establishing that difference. Um, and then, um, and then after that, looking at um, the differences uh, between um, um, the knockout mice who had gotten saline, that's the solid line, versus um, the, those that got ketamine. And as you see, they're here at baseline, but then it sort of dips down in a very rapid way, uh, the grooming behavior at one hour, and then slowly starts to come up um, at seven days. And so this is another way of sort of graphically depicting that, showing, um, interestingly, that the saline animals, when they got the saline injection, had a little bit of an increase um, in grooming behavior, whereas the, 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 the knockout mice that got ketamine had the sort of opposite effect. And the wild type, um, there, were, there was no difference. And you know, through, through many different um, you know, incredibly impressive techniques, um, ranging from behavioral um, uh, pharmacology and optogenetics, um, very exquisite experiments looking at in vivo fiber, fiber photometry, um, ex vivo slice, slice physiology, and in vivo calcium imaging. Um, uh, Lisa has uh, postulated this model um, showing that, um, that the, the increasing the dorsomedial prefrontal um, uh, cortical pro projection um, uh, neurons that are projecting into dorsal um, medial striatum, that, that, that um, increasing that activity either through ketamine, giving adding back ketamine, or optogenetic stimulation rescues the compulsive grooming behavior. And this is a nice summary, summary slide. And it, it's actually in, in press in Nature Communications, but also available in BioArchive. And so this taken together, these series of experiments um, demonstrate that ketamine increases activity um, in a circuit that causally controls compulsive grooming behavior. So again, tying that to the, to the mechanism um, and suggesting that the circuit, again, may, may be important for ketamine's therapeutic effects uh, in OCD. 
Um, and uh, Lisa uh, Ganadin uh, will be presenting this also at ACMP in, in December. Um, so you'll be able to um, you know, reach out to her with, with additional questions. And then uh, finally, partnering with um, Carlos Zarate, um, he has published along with Todd Gould, very interesting findings in, in animal model of depression, looking uh, at a metabolite of ketamine called RRHNK. Um, and one of the ideas behind this um, line of research is that if you're doing the, looking at the metabolite, potentially you could get the, the sort of wonderful antidepressive, anti-obsessional effects of the drug, but without having the side effects. And so currently um, there, uh, you know, there's an IND for this, it's going on to phase two studies and the International OCD Foundation is kindly um, uh, funded us to be able to um, test this, um, this compound in OCD individuals. Um, and uh, Carlos Serrata is generally, generously donating uh, that, that compound. Okay, so let's transition into back to, back to humans, back to mechanism. Um, I had, uh, you know, introduced the idea of, you know, the glutamate system, are there other mechanisms? One of the nice things, again, about experimental therapeutics is that you can use other drugs to test mechanism as well. And we um, wanted to look at this drug called um, naltrexone, which is opioid receptor antagonist. Um, and really start to tease apart this idea of, is this ketamine only acting on glutamate? You know, ketamine is, is a dirty compound. It acts through many, many different receptors beyond glutamate. Um, and so uh, this study was designed to, to look at um, the, uh, the opioid mechanism by introducing the, a blocker. So ketamine was infused once across two conditions with participants receiving pretreatment with naltrexone before one condition in a counterbalanced way. And so this study was led by um, uh, Dr. Nolan Williams and Forrest Hypus and in collaboration with Alan Schatzberg. And um, as you can see here in the design, it's a you know, pilot study. Um, and what we found is that pretreatment with the opioid antagonist attenuated antidepressant effects. So, you look at um, the mean uh, depression score here along the side, increasing numbers is more depression and days post ketamine. Um, for individuals that just got you know, the ketamine, ketamine by itself, and again, you're kind of seeing this trajectory, very quick um, antidepressant effects. But yet when you introduce the naltrexone, um, you get blocking of this effect. And what's interesting is if you pretreat with the opioid antagonist, um, it attenuates um, the antidepressant effects, but not the uh, dissociative symptoms, which I've, I've always found very fascinating. So um, in, in some, the study um, you know, kind of hints at that the opioid system activation is critical for ketamine's antidepressant effects. And the question now is sort of how do we reconcile this with prior, prior studies in glutamate? And so, you know, one, one thing that I, I think um, is important to, to think about is there's three distinct phases of ketamine, right? The rapid effects, the kind of maintenance of effects, and then the effects go away. And so is it possible that the glutamate um, downstream cascade and mechanisms are important <clears throat> for the sustained response, but that maybe the opioid system is responsible for the initial effects and the euphoric feelings and the, and the lightening of the mood. <coughs> Excuse me. So in addition to, um, you know, just kind of coming, coming back again to this notion that ketamine has side effects, we're exploring RRH and K. We also previously had looked to see if there were other interventions that could have these, um, um, you know, similar similar effects, um, but not have the side effects. And um, Dr. Joe Moscal is an inventor of this compound. You may have heard of it, Repastinel, which is a monoclonal antibody deprived neuropeptide, <coughs> and it's a putative NMDAR uh, modulator. And uh, met him at ACMP, and he kindly 
agreed to, to donate um, the study drug and we were able to get um, uh, um, NARSAT funding in order to be able to pursue a small pilot study. And, you know, building on this idea that, that rapacinel, at least in phase two studies, had shown at 10 mix per kick, this antidepressant effects. Um, and so we did a very simple, very small open label study giving a three to five minute push of IV rapacinel in individuals with OCD who are again unmedicated. Um, we excluded individuals that had uh, severe depression, so we could really focus on the obsessive um, uh, a spectrum of symptoms. And we used um, you know, a few different tools to look at depression, anxiety, and um, what we found was that you know, 90 minutes after the infusion, there was a decrease in, in these measures, but importantly, one week post-infusion, contrary to the ketamine, zero out of seven met response criteria for OCD. So you know, there, were, there were some inklings that this could be helpful for anxiety, but it just did not have the sort of robust, sustained response that we had seen with ketamine. However, it was very well tolerated. Um, you know, it was very easy for people to take. Um, you know, it, it didn't increase, um, you know, CADs. It didn't increase blood pressure. Um, but then, but then again, it didn't, it didn't really have effects on OCD. Um, so, um, you know, fast forward, um, there was a, you know, a phase three study in depression, which was a failed study. And, um, you know, long story short, um, rapastanol is, is not being followed up on. Okay, so now I want to switch over. We're talking about um, kind of molecular receptor level um, interventions. And I want to switch now to a new level, neuromodulation. And in the field of OCD, um, we're very fortunate to have FDA approved transcranial magnetic stimulation, which we'll talk about, um, and um, compassionate use approval for deep brain stimulation. Um, and so these, these um, interventions are really aimed at looking at circuit level uh, changes. And you know, if there is a, you know, hyperactive OCD circuit, could these types of interventions turn down the activity? Um, again, this is early stages, a lot more research needs to be done, but it's something, a challenge that we wanted to tackle with um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, collaborative group, in, in, including uh, Nolan Williams, Keith Sudheimer, um, uh, Dr. Curran, and uh, Lee Williams. So what we know is that there is FDA-approved um, repetitive transcranial stimulation with a coil uh, from Brainsway called H7. And the target is very deep targets, a medial prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex. Um, and as you can see here, one of the downsides about it is that um, the duration per session is 20 minutes, 29 sessions. Um, you need to have um, some expertise in uh, creating a hierarchy um, and um, doing a little bit of personalized symptom provocation. And the idea is to kind of bring, bring the OCD circuits online so that then you can stimulate them. And the total treatment duration, five days a week, six weeks, it's pretty intensive. Um, another thing is that there's the deeper that you go in the brain with these kind of technologies, the more spread there is. So there's like a much, you're hitting a much broader target. It's no longer kind of this like very focal, focal area. And one of the concerns, um, <clears throat> just anecdotally, is that folks with comorbid depression and OCD have gotten sort of anecdotal reports back that one of, one of those gets better and the other gets worse. And so we really have to uh, do a lot more research to kind of tease apart who we're recommending for these treatments and what, it, what is it targeting. Um, and from, from the study, we don't know um, because the personalized treatment provocation was done in, in, in both uh, the active and sham treatments, we don't know if it's, it's critical or necessary. And finally, as I, as I alluded to, just the time, it's really, you know, uh, it's a big time commitment on the part of a participant to come in daily during a workday for, for six weeks. 
So our team really wanted to tackle what are, what are promising optimizations? Can we, you know, I'm very, very motivated by rapid treatments, rapidly treating uh, individuals with OCD. So can we reduce, can we reduce the session, session time? Can we reduce the treatment duration? Can we increase the dose? Um, uh, just like with the medication, right? Um, you can increase the dose to see if you can get more, more robust outcomes. And finally, each person's brain is different. So can we include this element of uh, personalization? So theta burst stimulation you may have heard about. Um, this is you know, a, a type of natural brain rhythm um, and it's you know, effective uh, brain stimulation method. Um, the benefits are reducing the, the time in treatment while keeping similar efficacy to the to the um, traditional RTMS. Um, there's been a lot of literature as, as you see below. Um, and uh, you, know, you can get down the, you know, the 20 minute session down to 44 seconds with this modified continuous um, theta burst uh, stimulation. And so the idea is that depending on um, whether, what type of stimulation you use, you can either excite um, the neural circuits or, or, or inhibit the neural circuits. And so the, uh, the modified continuous theta burst uh, protocol that we're using uh, presumably decreases um, and inhibits um, the circuits. Um, and so what we wanted to test was here, right? So, you know, the standard treatment is three to four weeks, the Brainsway H7 uh, study was six weeks. We wanted to test whether in five days we could, we could decrease symptoms. And we also really increase the dose. So um, again, this is the number of pulses that you're getting with the brain sway and the new protocol that we're testing goes up to 90,000. And um, Dr. Williams and Sudheimer um, uh, patented this um, uh, technology where um, you, you are scanned ahead of time um, at resting state. And then there's a hierarchical clustering algorithm that you can apply to the resting state scan to identify where is the best place um, for you to stimulate on the, in the cortical so that you can actually link and target deeper brain structures. So in terms of the, the study design, um, again, OCD individuals, we excluded people with severe depression um, or any contraindications to TMS or MRI. Again, very small, you know, open label study just to see if there's a signal, are we kind of on the right track? Um, we used a TMS MagVenture Mag Pro. Um, we used the local light neuronavigation system to position the coil um, and use the, 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 um, the, the target that was, that was mapped out ahead of time. Um, and so, so the phase one patients, patients come in, they're scanned, they get an eight minute resting state uh, sequence. And that right frontal pole subunit showing the greatest connectivity across all the subunits of the ventral striatum is selected as the stimulation target. And then we plug that information into the, into the uh, local light system. And then we can put a marker on the head. Um, it's a, kind of like a little T-based um, uh, marker. And then using the, the arm here, um, you can actually determine where the, the, um, the paddle needs to go in order to, to apply the stimulation. Um, and so these are the individual target locations. Um, the reference region for FP2 um, is there for, for those of you who, are, who do TMS for reference. And um, what we found is that, um, you know, looking at the, you know, of, of the Y box, it started pretty high. Um, and then one week later, we were already getting, you know, 75% reduction, 63% reduction, 54%, um, 50. And it was like relatively um, sustained for some individuals. Some continued <coughs> to have improvement. Some people didn't and then did, and some people did and then didn't. There's a lot of variability. Um, and then the second part we wanted to, we added in some, some markers just to explore looking at 
a go no go task. So looking at um, inhibitory control and also functional connectivity. And what we uh, we did was just kind of again, this is very very low end, but just to kind of see what you know what what we could find a sort of exploratory study. Um, looking at responders um, versus non-responders and showing greater decrease um, in, the, in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex during uh, cognitive control task following the protocol and differences um, in functional connectivity as well. The nice thing, again, as a clinician, I really like this. So there were, you know, very, very minimal side effects. So there was headache that resolved, you know, by three days post stimulation start and fatigue, but really no, no serious adverse uh, events. So in sum, um, there was robust and rapid in five out of seven uh, individuals had at least 50% reduction in Y box within seven to 14 days. And in a subset, so three out of five, the effects lasted up to four weeks. Um, it's non-invasive, minimal transient side effect, and um, you know the stimulation is um, across five days. But you know the nice thing about science is that it generates new questions, which is why do most but not all patients respond if we're targeting them, and why do some have peak response at different times and others have more durable response? So we're we're you know this is really opening. I think an exciting direction in terms of how do we sort of personalize this and, and what, what kind of markers can we use to really tease this apart. Um, so uh, future directions are hopefully unblinding um, our ketamine, larger ketamine study, um, testing out metabolites and um, you know, continuing collaborations, interdisciplinary collaborations um, across different studies and projects. And you know, continuing to explore these, these circuit, circuit based um, uh, neuromodulation uh, avenues. Um, as well, you know, I'm in incredibly interested in uh, this idea of like just perseverative thoughts and intrusive thoughts, which span across um, intrusive uh, nightmares and flashbacks from PTSD and um, during, during the day with flashbacks and during night with nightmares. Um, you know, intrusive thoughts, uh, uh, perseverative thoughts of, of ruminations and depression and, and suicidal thoughts. So we're branching out into new studies in these, these directions and uh, really, really motivated to, to partner with, with individuals who want to explore those with us. So tying it back, you know, as a clinician, I, I'm really, really encouraged um, with the state of the field. And, you know, I think you know, for, for uh, you know, the case of John Disguised, um, who participated in the study, um, you know, he, he was able by, you know, trying out new experimental uh, venues, able to then go on to have relief, go on to exposure and response prevention, and eventually get back to college and, um, you know, continue, continue on in his trajectory. I feel <clears throat> incredibly fortunate to, to work with a very talented uh, bunch of folks in the lab, but importantly, just um, in interdisciplinary um, ways. And one of the, one of the wonderful things um, <clears throat> about, uh, about science is that you can um, get interested in a topic and idea and um, find other folks who, who are want, want to partner and explore those ideas um, as well. We're always looking for um, you know, participants who want to participate in our studies. Please reach out to us to ocbresearch.stanford.edu, or um, if you'd like to collaborate or, or join us in collaborations. These are my uh, funding and disclosures and some references. Dr. Rodriguez, thank you so much for that fantastic talk um, and for uh, giving us such a breadth and scope of um, what your lab is doing and also novel treatments for OCD. I know many people who have uh, tuned in are very interested in treatment uh, for OCD and new breakthrough treatments for OCD. So um, <clears throat> I wanna just tell our audience, this is the time for you to put uh, questions in the Q&A and I'm going to modulate, mo modulate <laughs> going to moderate our discussion right now, but also I wanna remind you 
that for those of you who'd like to stay on um, after Grand Rounds concludes for a career talk, um, please do because Dr. Rodriguez is going to um, uh, engage in a career-based uh, seminar, really. We will um, promote you to being a panelist and we'll have a, Q, uh, a back and forth Q&A. Um, and she's gonna be talking about challenges, opportunities, and lessons learned in academic research career paths. So I encourage you to stay on for that. And with that, I have a couple of questions that I wanted to pose to you. Um, one, um, uh, one of our uh, participants today was interested to know in the small studies, that, the relatively small studies that you're doing, it, do you have any uh, data on diversity of the sample? Um, and could you comment on that? Um, I, I really appreciate um, that question and, and the thoughtfulness of it. And um, Monica Williams is somebody who's really led uh, a lot of really wonderful, thoughtful work in terms of diversity in OCD research studies in particular. Um, and, you know, what we find is that generally OCD studies tend to lean, you know, Caucasian. There, there is, you know, gender representation, but just not, not enough diversity that we would want. And so it's really important to actively recruit and in all different kinds of populations. Um, and um, I've written before about, um, about social media and how that can be really powerful in sort of extending reach, educating populations. Um, the studies that I've described um, also tend uh, to, to lean um, to you know, majority white, um, but um, they're, they are improving. Um, and I'm not sure if it's due to you know, our, our recruitment efforts um, or uh, potentially just having a representation of a PI that is diverse. So um, you know, I've had patients you know, come and start talking to me in Spanish. And, you know, the study is like, you know, it, it, purely in English. So our independent evaluators, you know, only speak English. But I think that connection is really helpful. And just to, um, you know, uh, be able to, to encourage folks that are from diverse backgrounds to, to run clinical studies, I think is, is very important. So th thank you for that question. Thank you very much. Um, Here's another question. Uh, given that both ketamine and TMS are used to treat depression and you presented evidence that um, they might also reduce or that they do reduce OCD symptoms, how do you understand the differences in these disorders when the same treatments can be effective for both sets of symptoms? Um, I, this is a million dollar question. I'm so interested in the interplay and, and it's not just you know ketamine and TMS, right? SSRIs are helpful for depression and um, OCD and many anxiety disorders. And, um, you know, why is it, you know, I, I, you know, we could ponder together, why is it that SSRIs at lower doses are good for depression? And why is it in OCD you need higher doses? And I see these little glimpses, you know, higher and longer, right, than depression. Depression, you can kind of see effects within two weeks, but in OCD, like 10, you know, up to 12 weeks. Um, so we see these little glimpses um, clinically, um, but also like as, as we're applying these treatments, they are a little bit different. In ketamine, um, you know, in depression, on average, it's a few days. And some of our initial OCD studies show that the effects persist a little bit longer. Um, and, and unfortunately, one of the challenges is that um, there aren't many funding mechanisms that fund comorbid, you know, studies of comorbidity and kind of these careful studies where you would kind of look at the, the, the physiology. I wish we did. I think it's, I think it would really help illuminate a lot of the underlying mechanisms. Great question. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, perhaps this is a follow-on question, um, which is, and maybe there's not really a great answer to this, but, you know, you, you allude to the fact that uh, at the end of your talk that perseverative and intrusive thoughts they're actually, you know, um, they're, you know, obviously a major part of OCD and of the diagnostic criteria, but they are present in other disorders like depression and um, PTSD. I just was curious um, whether or not there have been neuroimaging studies to, eval to evaluate, just as you suggest, basic uh, neurobiology um, and neuroimaging of 
um, people with different disorders where there are similar intrusive and depressive thoughts just to illuminate those kinds of mechanisms? Or do we see these same types of uh, neuroimaging um, results or different or don't we know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, again, this, um, this sort of speaks to sort of the, you know, I see a lot of studies that are disorder specific, and it's really exciting now as the field is like coming to these kind of cross diagnostic underlying mechanistic issues. So what are, how, you know, we don't know how are thoughts generated? Why do they pop up? What makes them continue? Um, these are the sort of basic fundamental questions that I think are unknown, but very much appreciate and tip my hat to the researchers here at McLean and other, you know, across the country who are doing like careful neuroimaging studies to try and to try and look at this, right? <clears throat> and there's a lot of constructs and the NIH has the RDOC initiative and others looking at inhibitory control, valence, how motion may, may, may play a role in this. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really, really excited to, to, to see where the field goes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know that you mentioned at the end that um, you have um, an NIH study that is just wrapped up. So you're about to start to have the opportunity to look at the results of that study um, and um, where you've got an active, a more active control to ketamine. So that should be very, very interesting to see. And um, I wondered what you're thinking about in terms of your next steps for your research, given uh, I know you mentioned the PTSD area. We have a few minutes, and I'm just curious if you might tell us a little more about your next directions. Yeah, <clears throat> well, with um, PTSD, um, we're following up a really interesting thread looking at nitrous oxide or laughing gas. Um, there have been um, some new reports um, in depression that nitrous oxide, which has some glutamate and opiate properties, I have like a little pet theory about whether it's just glutamate or opiate or, or the combination together that can be helpful, um, that, that uh, we, we did like, a, again, a very small pilot study showing robust decreases in PTSD with um, nitrous oxide. And now we have a four-year study at the uh, VA uh, randomizing to uh, nitrous gas and saline versus nitrogen gas and midazolam um, in PTSD to just do a, a larger kind of phase two proof of concept, feasibility, safety, efficacy um, of that, uh, that compound. Um, what I like about nitrous oxide is that um, if anybody has had, raise your hand. No, I'm just kidding. Um, in, in the dentist, uh, you can get um, you know, yeah. nitrogen gas. Kids get it you know, before their like, teeth are pulled out. It's like very well used. And it's so quick that you can have that procedure, get back in your car and drive home. So I really like that part that it's like rapid on, rapid off. Um, even, you know, in the military, they're exploring nitrous gas for pain in the field. And I, you know, with PTSD, veterans that I see at the Palo Alto VA also have a lot of pain. And so is there some sort of connection? Um, I like to explore the kind of psychiatric pain and the physical pain. And so that nitro nitrogen gas may be a way to kind of reduce pain get people into treatment, CBT-based treatment, pain-based treatment, and just get them out of that acute state. Yeah, thank you so much for that answer. Um, we have one more question. I think we have time for this one. Um, someone would like to know, since there are many symptom comorbidities between OCD and ADD, ADHD, like skin picking, for example, um, is there any evidence that ketamine could help ADHD? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Un unknown, right? Unknown. Yeah. Well, I think that's um, also very interesting about um, the exploration of nitrous oxide and its potential therapeutic effects. Um, I had not been aware of that that was being explored in the ways that you, um, that you indicate. And I think that um, that's really an interesting thing since it is very well known. It's been used for so many years. Um, so mm -hmm. it had a therapeutic benefit that could be very interesting um, for the field. 
Um, I'm just looking, but I don't think we have any additional um, questions in, in the Q&A. And so we, we can wrap up, we have two minutes to go. And what I'd like to do is thank you very much for um, a wonderful talk. I really appreciate um, your being here, um, helping us celebrate Women in Medicine and Science Month. And we like, we're happy to welcome you back to McLean, uh, both uh, today and also hopefully in the future when you can come in person.